set to go? Good. My name is Ed Morris, and I'm with iOpen. Uh, I also work at Purdue, and I'm glad to be here. And I'm very happy to share with you some ideas that we've developed on uh, how you might apply open source software development to open source economic development. Uh, this presentation is going to give us a little bit of a sense of how to do that. But first of all, I want to get a little bit of a vision of Ohio going here. Um, this is a, uh, a video coming out of North Carolina. But it shows you essentially the type of, of uh, economy that I think we ought to be aiming for in Northeast Ohio and in Ohio generally. It's an economy based on people. Volume on the computer, yep, sure. Sorry, apologize for that. That's not the uh, that's not the that's not the audio for her, that's not the audio for her. Coming from my computer. Okay. Point about this is simply that uh, we need to have a much more open, integrated, uh, connected environment in Northeast Ohio, and we've been exploring ways to get there. Um, if you look at Northeast Ohio in uh, 2002, the top frame essentially shows you what it was like. It was a bunch of uh, arrows heading off in different directions. What we've got now in Northeast Ohio is a, uh, is a vision imposed from above about what Northeast Ohio should be. It's not really going to work. Uh, and what we're heading for is a more aligned sense of direction, sense of innovation. And we're going to tell you how to get there. But first, we've got to understand what happened to the economy here in Northeast Ohio. These are the uh, great Hewlett iron ore unloaders who were on the uh, banks of, of uh, Lake Erie. Uh, they no longer exist, but uh, our grandfather's economy was all based on moving a lot of stuff, moving steel, coal, oil, uh, moving a lot of materials. This is one of the first Edison films in 1897 taken on the banks of Lake Erie. And it shows you some of the innovation that took place that generated the wealth in this region that gave us a lot of what you see around town now, which is the Museum of Art, uh, the institutions, the banks, um, the educational institutions. What's interesting about this is that the guys on the right were told not to move during this whole video because they don't move at all. Everything else moves, but they don't. But that's, this is the metrics of our success. This is how we, how we uh, developed. We developed huge uh, wealth in this region. This is obviously just a few blocks from here. And you can see what, what happened. Well, in 1965 to 68, the steel industry started to peak, and everything started going downhill from there. Uh, this is uh, steel industry declining and population declining. So what do we do? Well, in order to understand what we do, you have to understand how to build wealth in an economy. So this is an important set of slides to keep, your, uh, keep an understanding of how you build wealth. First, good money. We need to build businesses that generate wealth from outside this region. Uh, neutral money, we need to accelerate the velocity of neutral money buying products and goods and services from each other and reducing the flow of bad money out. It's become tough to do that simply because competition for traded businesses, these sophisticated businesses becoming more complex. Walmarts are, are uh, sapping the energy out of our downtowns, and young people are obviously moving away. If you look at a cycle of business development, this is a an accelerating cycle of prosperity in regions like Austin and like uh, Research Triangle and like uh, Silicon Valley, you have an accelerating cycle. 
We're, however, caught in a downward cycle right now. And the question is, how do we break out of that downward cycle? How do we break out of this downward cycle? The challenge is today to come up with a new model for economic development, a new way to build prosperity, a new way to engage ourselves and build new opportunities. And this is means climbing up onto the second curve. The second curve is all about transitioning away from our grandfather's economy. Our grandfather's economy has faced enormous pressures over the last 40 years from cost declining. The internet exploded. And all of these things have blown apart the grandfather's economy, but they create new, whole new opportunities for us in a second curve economy, an economy built on wealth, link and leverage type networks. What we have to do is figure out ways to take our assets from the first curve economy and start to link them to the second curve economy. And a lot of that's going to happen over the internet. A lot of that's going to happen by the integration of software development with economic development. Key point number one, in order to accelerate and move on to the second curve, we're going to have to innovate. We're going to have to figure out new ways of working together. Key point number two, to innovate, we need to start shifting our thinking away from hierarchies to networks. Stop looking for permission to do things. Start doing things. Stop complaining. Stop whining. Move ahead. Key point number three, the command and control system that operates in this region doesn't work. It will never work. Key point number three is that uh, in addition to it not working, it's complex. There are a lot of opportunities out there to link and leverage different organizations. This is the economic development system in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And you can see how complicated it is. A similar system operates in Northeast Ohio. It's very complicated. It's very complex. You're never going to command and control it. So we need to connect and align resources in this civic space, thinking about linking and leveraging. So the, hot, the uh, soft stuff becomes the hard stuff. Linking and leveraging, figuring out how to manage this is going to become difficult. Key point number five, we need to balance open participation with leadership direction. And the leadership can come from anywhere. It can come from a 22, 23-year-old who, for example, in Indiana, decided that he wanted to see if he could get one of the small towns off the grid. He worked at the Department of Agriculture. He came up with a concept called Biotown. He sold it to the Secretary of Agriculture, who sold it to the governor. Biotown is now in Reynolds, Indiana. And it's a whole group of people trying to figure out how to run an economy off of biofuels. That was an idea that a 23-year-old kid came up with about a year ago. And it's moving ahead. So transparency and trust, figuring out how to work together, these are all principles of open source. Transparency and trust are strategic. They lead to strong civic networks. Regions with stronger networks are going to be more prosperous. They're going to align faster. They're going to act faster. Uh, this is the principle of open source software development. Same principles of open source software development can be applied in the real world, in the economic development world. Key point number six. Our if we start doing this, our opportunities are going to start to grow. They're going to start to grow exponentially. Key point number seven, people move in the, in the direction of their conversations. So we can ignite new opportunities by talking about how do we map our assets, how do we connect our assets together in a new and different way. Well, this is an idea, for example, that's happening up in Toronto right now. Bar Camp is a, an ad hoc gathering of people who come together and figure out some new ideas and start mapping their resources. This is happening up in Toronto. Uh, we ought to get these people down here, come down and teach us how to do bar camps. Key point number eight, the way to move ahead in this discipline is to have a discipline. And that discipline means exploring, focusing, aligning and executing. And it's a discipline that we can teach each other and we can share just like you have the same discipline in open source software development. Regions around the country are figuring this stuff out. Here's a key point. 
that a lot of people don't understand. If we're going to move ahead in this kind of an economy, we've got to take a Shanghai perspective. The Shanghai perspective is the perspective of the world on the right. When I was in China in 1993, I was sitting in a government office and I saw a map of the world and I looked at it and it was the map on the right. And that map seemed to be odd to me and I couldn't quite figure it out and then I realized that's the map of the world from a Shanghai perspective. And that's the map that we need to start thinking about if we're going to move ahead. So our new model of economic development has got to be around building networks. Networks in brain power, innovation, quality connected places, branding, civic leadership. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit of how to do that. The strategic activities involve building these kind of networks through con connect and develop strategies, link and leverage open networks. This new roadmap looks like this. We're going to have networks and regions will increasingly have networks in five key areas. The first is in brain power, helping schools develop much more responsive, flexible, adaptive, high quality education. Number two, we've got to have entrepreneurship and innovation networks that enable people to take their ideas and move them into businesses as quickly as possible. This is what you see in Research Triangle in Austin. doesn't exist very much here. It's very thin, very slow. We have to have effective branding. We have to tell the story. What is the story of Northeast Ohio? What is the story of Ohio? Right now, we're in the slowest growth region of the slowest growth state of the slowest growth sector of the country, the Great Lakes. So how can we accelerate growth? Well, we accelerate growth by looking at what our assets are and how we can connect them and start moving together and accelerating this. That also requires us to focus on building quality connected places. It's not about convention centers. It's not about casinos. It's about creating quality connected places around our campuses, in our downtowns, and uh, in our small towns. And then finally, we need to build, to, build, to build new opportunities in civic collaboration, new ways of working together. So you may have heard about Tom Peters. You may have heard about uh, Michael Porter. You may have heard about Richard Florida or the new urbanists. Well, they're all right, but they're all looking at only one portion of the, of the equation. So part of our challenge is to start developing a regional economy that starts to look like this, which are networks embedded in other networks, networks tied to other networks. And the real challenge for software development and for internet developers is to figure out how to integrate all this stuff in ways that people can understand it and use it. Valdis Krebs is working in this area. He was here yesterday. Valdis is working on a whole set of new opportunities in social networks, social software, to try to map networks. So what are we talking about, though, when we talk about building networks? We're talking about high school reform models, getting out and figuring out how to help high schools accelerate their reform. Now, does this require a big effort? Not really. Uh, a small group of people in Indiana have decided that they're going to reform their high school. They went out, raised the money. They're accelerating and developing a new tech high model based out of California. They've convinced people that this is what, what they need to do, and they're moving ahead. It's taken them a year and a half. Manufacturing boot camp, it's another idea that came out of uh, Indiana where I've been doing a lot of work. Uh, two people came up with this idea, and now they're spreading it around uh, Indiana. What does that mean? Manufacturing boot camp is designed for those kids who came, came out of high school with no career, no skills. Uh, now they're going through an 18-week 18, 18 process after high school, and they're getting jobs and they're moving ahead, and 83% of them are employed. Entrepreneurship training in every high school. In the 14-county region in Indiana, we're going to have entrepreneurship training in every high school. 
business plan competitions in high schools. How do you develop all these things? Building quality connected places, main street programs, expanding broadband infrastructures. How do you get engaged? What do you do? Branding, effective heritage tourism, figuring out where we can bring new people in to the region. Regional food brands, this is something that's happening in southern Ohio, around the universe, Ohio University. It's a whole bunch of food entrepreneurs have gotten together and started to brand their food in a regional branding. Weekly civic forums. We're doing this right now at Cleveland Institute of Art. We did it at Case when I was there. This is an expanding opportunity. The Charleston Digital Corridor is doing this down in Charleston, South Carolina. They saw the idea and they said, let's do it. They went ahead and started. How much does this cost? Cost cookies and coffee. Regional forums move ahead. So this is the map that increasingly regions are using to keep track of what's going on, to keep track of their networks, to start working together, to start collaborating, to start uh, finding new ways to move ahead, to stop complaining, to stop whining, and to start acting. So let's talk about the basics of starting out. What is that? Strategic doing. This is the civic discipline. It's a four-step process. The first step is to figure out what our assets are, what we could do together, how we could collaborate. The only reason I'm here is to figure out how I might collaborate with one, two, three, four of you, figure out how we might work together. Second is to focus on something. Focus on a project quickly. Figure out what you can do together. Collaborate. Third is align. Figure out what resources we need. Move ahead. Fourth is to execute and then to do it again. Now, developing and moving around this circle doesn't take time. We've moved a group of 200 people around this circle in two hours. 20 minutes, 30 minutes at each stop. This isn't a six-month process. This isn't a two-year process. This is a daily process, a weekly process, a monthly process. It's something we can do if we have the interest and the desire to do it. So let's look at these forums. At Future, now out at the Cleveland Institute of Art, they're focused on, they have monthly forums, focused on the digital role of digital media. Just uh, down the way here, this Future Forum is exploring how Northeast Ohio could become a leader in creative digital media. Is this an outside the box thought? No, Muncie, Indiana is ahead of us. The triad region of North Carolina is ahead of us. Why? Because they see the opportunity and they're moving. We're not moving. We've got to move. Just a little bit down the way here, in Midtown, you have a civic forum. Civic forum that starts every Friday. It's now moving to every other Friday, I believe. But it's a, an effort to try to ignite new ideas in Midtown. So they're using workshops and exercises to move around this circle. And they're also focused on how do we create an opportunity here? Uh, how do we make this fun? There, you bet there's a brain drain in Cleveland and it happens every Friday at the Need Brand Partners Loft. Lots of coffee, no wine. You're here, which means you're at the right place at the right time. Everyone leaves with a buzz, and it's only partly due to the coffee. We're here, I'm here, to see if there's anybody interested in working with iOpen. iOpen is based here in Northeast Ohio. We have a partner. We have several partnerships going. One is with an economic modeling company out of Idaho, and we've just formed a partnership with Neartime which is a Web 2.0 company based in Research Triangle. Uh, we're finding partners all over the country. We're not finding them here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we want to reach out for, to uh, young people, to people who want to get involved and engaged and work with us. Uh, we're developing new models for economic development that are exciting, that are engaging, that are focused, that are practical, 
that are immediate, um, and that are transformative. The people at near time saw the opportunity in working with us, and so they're putting in five people to work on our team. We build collaborative platforms based on Web 2.0 technologies, integration of wikis and uh, web logs, a variety of other opportunities that are come out of that platform, including an e-commerce engine that enables us to monetize some of these platforms to keep it going outside of the framework, the traditional nonprofit framework, which is take your hat off, hold it out, and hope some foundation will drop some money into it. That old model doesn't work. It's not going to work here, and uh, it's not something that we're pursuing. We're pursuing a value-added strategy that's based on developing new types of collaborations and monetizing them along the concept of the long tail. So what's next? Is there support among the, the uh, folks in Nauticon to have an open network of open source software developers to support open source economic development? That's the open question. I put up a website uh, this morning, which I'll um, link to. You can copy down the URL if you're interested. It's noticon iopen.neartime.net. This enables us to collaborate. You can join it, join the space. Um, we can work together using the Neartime platform. That's not something you want to do. We've got the Drupal platform going in some places. Uh, Obviously, uh, WordPress is a very simple blog platform that people are using. Uh, but you've got to find ways to connect and, and, and move people forward. And in order to do that, we've got to have some software tools, internet tools to do it. Uh, if there are people in Northeast Ohio who want to work with Open, we're open to it. Um, but as I said, we're already moving ahead with, with groups outside of the region simply because we see some real opportunity. They looked for us, they found us, and they started to ask to connect. So with that, I want to open any discussion or any questions that you might have. That's pretty much the outline of what we're doing in iOpen. We have a new opportunity, I think, here in Northeast Ohio to link up what we're doing with, uh, with what, uh, what's taking place in, uh, with Laz uh, Kozman, who's uh, who's a consultant here in town, has been working with us, with uh, Valdis Krebs, who's been working with us, uh, and the uh, invitation is always open to participate. Any thoughts, any questions? Yeah. Sorry, your focus seems to be on the um, open source innovation, and you've mentioned software, but some of your examples were of manufacturing. Uh, I'm wondering if they're attempting to use uh, uh, to take these kids that, that uh, are, are going a vocational route and trying to see if, they're, uh, if they can be adapted to do software type stuff, manufacturing but in a software sense, manufacturing widgets and things like this. Um, I well, I mean, you know, th these, are, these are old categories, so you've got to yeah. reckon. If you are in manufacturing now, if you don't understand uh, software development, at least on a rudimentary level, um, and increasingly, if you don't, don't understand Web 2.0 tools and can't operate in those, those environments, you're going to become increasingly obsolete. Manufacturing has become a high-tech business. It's not about uh, sitting there and tightening bolts. All those jobs are, have gone or are going overseas. Uh, so manufacturing becomes a, a higher technology business that involves the integration. Uh, and increasingly, what I'm talking about are collaborative tools, uh, knowledge sharing, and building those kinds of uh, communities, knowledge communities, across working groups within a company, across companies, the collaboration that has to happen with, among these manufacturers. So you've got to find people who are, feel comfortable in that world. So I don't see it as a manufacturing versus software or I don't see a hard division between those two. On that note, Ed, um, recently 
Alvin Toffler talked in Youngstown, yes. and he talked about that there is a place for manufacturing today, but we are going from mass manufacturing to advanced manufacturing, which means that it will be become more customized and will need more technological, you know, more software, more things like that. So manufacturing is still an it, a part, but it, it's evolving into something more. What do you call it? Yeah, demassification. Let me uh, let me try to to put a finer point on that. Uh, we're talking about moving from a first curve economy to a second curve economy. The, what defines the first curve economy and the second curve economy are the business models underlying those economies. The business model underlying the first curve economy is hierarchical. It m leads to a multi-divisional structure in a corporation. It's all about trying to control large flows. And hierarchies are, are great at doing that. You have to have hierarchies to do that. Now we're moving toward business models that are more networked. We have auto manufacturers who are on the first curve. General Motors and Ford are stuck on the first curve. The second curve automo man automobile manufacturers are Toyota and Honda. So it's not, a, it's not a move from, as Gloria points out, it's not a move away from manufacturing. It's a move toward a different type of manufacturing based on a different business model. And the business model is involved, involves networks, business networks. And it, it is increasingly going to be driven off the internet. The internet is our first interactive mass medium. We haven't really quite figured out what that means yet. But what it does mean with Web 2.0 is the exploitation by people without strong computer backgrounds of the interactivity of the net. That's what Web 2.0 tools are all about. Can you put those Web 2.0 tools in the hands of people who don't have a background in business, uh, in uh, software development? Example, Wufu. Look at what Wufu is able to do. You're sitting at your desk. You don't have any background in, that, in, uh, in software development. You have a customer list of 5,000 people. In the space of about three minutes, you can query those 5,000 people, send out a Wufu survey, and get the results back within eight hours. Now, that's extremely powerful. And you, know now, you don't need a software background to do that. That's what a Web 2.0 tool does. So it creates all sorts of new opportunities for network business models. All sorts of new opportunities. But the economic development structure, the way in which we approach economic development, the way in which we approach our civic space is going to change. And the regions that figure this out faster are going to prosper better, uh, prosper uh, uh, more. Yep. That, that thing you just said, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, right, 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 right. I don't know. Do, do people know about Wufu? Okay, well, Wufu is a, again, a, uh, go onto the web, look at wufu.com. I'll try to draw it up here. Uh, it's essentially a form builder, survey builder that enables you to uh, build a fairly complex interview, questionnaire. People are familiar with, uh, with uh, SurveyMonkey, right? Rather clunky first effort. Wufu is much more sophisticated. Now you can take these and embed them in a blog. Uh, so if you have a blog and you want to survey your readers, throw out a Wufu survey. You get the results back. You can look at the results. Um, another question over here? Yeah, when you talk about economic development and collaboration, uh, what are your thoughts on all the activity, the recent activity with groups like Jumpstart, Team Neo, Fund for Economic Development Future, Magnet, suppose we all coming together in a collaborative regional effort, and then, of course, the overlay of the third frontier monies? 
How does that Well, I think, in? again, part of, it's not a question of not having enough resources. We have enormous resources here in this region. I mean, we have, we have the strongest, or one of the strongest foundation bases. But what we, what we have is, right now, in my view, is a, uh, a process that looks more like uh, what I was showing you before, which is, you know, in my sense is that we've got something like Northeast Ohio today, where we've, we've got a, a vision, but it's not quite coherent, it's not quite, uh, it's imposed in a certain, in, in a very fundamental way, um, and people are still going this way. Uh, and that's a, that's a tragedy because of all the money and all the time that's been spent on this. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm mystified by this Cleveland Plus campaign, uh, uh, simply because it's a good campaign for Cleveland. It's a very good campaign. It's a good idea for Cleveland, but I thought we were building a region. I thought we were building a Northeast Ohio region. Uh, so if, if it's a greater Cleveland brand, um, that's great. I'm, I'm all for it. But if it's a regional brand, then it really doesn't quite jive up for me. But that's my reaction. Yeah. Uh, I can understand uh, how this would help spread the wealth, um, keep, keep uh, everybody uh, in the knowledge of knowing how to do their business right and, and more efficiently. But I can see where this doesn't, I can't see how this effectively uh, um, makes people more willing to spend money to improve the economy. Um. It's not about people spending money. It's about people creating ideas to generate wealth. It's about, this is about you having an idea and you uh, to build a business and you being able to quickly get the resources you need to build that business so that you become wealthy. That's what this is all about. I don't really, it's not about spending mo the money. Well, well you ha the, the co the, for economy to work, I mean, you, the consumers have to be willing to spend the money to, to buy into these businesses. How, how is this going to help um, encourage people to get into, get into the well, whole Well, here, let me go money. back to this, this, because essentially, there, there are two things that you, you've got to keep straight in your mind. The first is you need these traded businesses, these businesses that build wealth in our region because they're able to sell products and services outside the region. Ninety percent of what I do, I sell to people outside Northeast Ohio. I, I individually am a traded business. All right. There is a second set of businesses which are businesses that essentially sell locally. Those are important as well. Those are businesses that, uh, that serve a local market. And we want those businesses to grow and to prosper. Those businesses, we want to be buying and selling from each other. Increasingly, that doesn't happen, for example, when a Walmart moves into a small town and the downtown dries up. Increasingly, you've, you've, you've made it much more difficult for that acceleration to happen. So you've got two issues that you're really focused on. I'm primarily interested in the first. Your question goes really, I think, to the second, which is you've got to have people. But if you don't have the traded businesses to pour money into the regional economy, you're not going to have a lot of circulation. So you've got to do both. And the question is, we used to have businesses that poured a lot of money into this region because they sold steel and automobiles and auto parts and, and, uh, and all sorts of metal product, metal stamping. But that, those businesses peaked, started in about 1965, 67 time frame. And we have not built new businesses to replace them. Now we're making some progress. There's no doubt about it. There's, uh, there's progress being made with the clinic and there's progress being made in medical equipment and things. But our progress relative to other places that fa are facing the same set of challenges is slower. And part of the reason it's slower is because we're not collaborating enough locally. 
We're not figuring out. We're not sitting down and saying, well, how could I help you make your business so stronger? If you have a business idea, where do you go? The answer is? You don't know. The answer is you don't know. The answer is you don't know. And that shouldn't be the answer. The answer should be, I can go here, or here, or here, or here, or here, and those things ought to be on the top of your head, right? Now, if you go to a place like Research Triangle, you have people immediately, quickly connecting. Now, we're starting to build some of those connections, but again, as a region, as a region, we're moving slower than other regions, and we don't need to be. We can move faster. We can, can pick up the pace. We can pick up the pace. Yeah. On that note, um, Meet the Bloggers interviewed the Greater Cleveland Marketing Alliance about this Cleveland Plus campaign before we couldn't know what the name was and everything. And, mm -hmm. and Rick Batico has uh, used the network model that you were talking about, the collaboration. He's gone out into small towns and Mansfield, everywhere, and built these networks. Um, the marketing gal was touting this as this was this wonderful database of being able to reach those people at a minute's no notice to tell them. With the push of a button. With the push of a button, kind of like asking for a survey, mm -hmm. really not using what you were saying, what a network can do with that collaborative thing of telling you where you go for your business idea. So I think that is what's missing in Northeast, it, well, right. in Cleveland. I mean, part, part of the, what the Internet does, Gloria, and this is, this is going to be difficult for some folks to understand, but what the, in it, the Internet effectively does is make market research irrelevant. Exactly. And so, you know, business models that are driven off of market research are going to be slower, they're going to be less responsive. Uh, they're not going to be focused on quick co-creation of value between a customer and a business. That's what a WUFU does. A WUFU puts that power, power into the hands of a sole entrepreneur. Now, that's just one small piece of a Web 2.0 platform. But next to this, you explore the content, the geography. Right. Right. Do you add the like of say about that page from bloggers in your mother's basement? Well, I'll give you, give you an example of why, wh how, this, how this works. In Owen County, Kentucky, which is in uh, eastern Kentucky, uh, probably about an hour from the airport, uh, the northern Kentucky airport, Cincinnati northern Kentucky airport, they now have a high-tech company with about 200 employees that relocated from Manhattan. All the guy needed was a T1 line. He got that, boom, he's, he's ready to go. So the point of that is you look at places like take Scottsburg, Indiana. The mayor of Scottsburg, frustrated that he couldn't get his telephone company to put in a broadband, said we're going to build it. So he, he, brought a, he built a municipal wireless network for Scottsburg. He hired, he did a really smart thing. He hired a young woman out of IU, 24 years old, and now they have a countywide wireless network. Did they bypass the cable? Yeah. Okay, and, and at that time you had AT&T coming in now, mm -hmm. going ahead and to get an antiquated 1960 cable system, and yet we have smaller uh, municipalities. I'm just saying that, 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 that what's happening here is you're breaking up, you're, it's breaking apart. The old economy is breaking apart. And the, the regions that figure out that the old way of doing things doesn't work as effectively as a new way of doing things, those regions are going to move ahead. That's where people are going to want to live. That's where smart kids are going to stay. Uh, that's where businesses are going to move. So prosperity is going to go to locations, and it can be rural and it can be urban. It will go to locations that understand the power 
of the basic precept of open source software development, which is we can develop very complex projects with a combination of open participation and leadership direction and simple rules. That's the lesson of Linux. And it's increasingly going to be the lesson of regional economic development. Yes. Uh, do you have any examples of uh, Wufu being used? Of Wufu being used? Yeah. Yeah, I just used it. I use it all the time. It's being uh, integrated into the New York Times. Description of the process you've gone through to use it, if you're using it. A little bit about that. I okay. mean, you're showing us here, but yeah. uh, how, you, how you instituted it, you know, some of the things that changed as you went along a little bit, just how you did it. We're, we're now focused on taking a weblog that I have, which is called ED Pro. ED Pro has about 1,800 opt-in subscribers to a free weekly email update. ED Pro is probably one of the top one or two uh, publications in the economic development field right now. Uh, I have not tried to monetize it. I don't charge for it. I want to monetize it. I want to use a platform to monetize it. So the question is, how do I monetize it? What are the features within uh, uh, additional value-added features that I could add to a blog that people were willing to pay for? And secondly, how much are they willing to pay for that? I launched a, an interview on Monday, on a Monday, and by Wednesday I knew the answers. I knew, for example, that about a third of my audience wanted the ability to interact with each other. They want to know who the other members are. About a third of my audience wants immediately podcasts or uh, webinars of some sort. Uh, another third don't know. Depends on the content. About 85% of my audience wants access to my library. Wants access to my library. I have 10,000 articles. I have about 2,000 reports. I've been collecting these things for six years. I have an extensive ED economic development library that's very detailed. Um, so how much are willing, people willing to pay? Minimum amount of money is probably about nine bucks a month on up. Are they willing to pay per, per event? Yeah, they're willing to pay per event. In other words, I have a webcast on a particular topic. They want to opt in. So I need a web platform that's going to be, enable me to do that. Uh, my partners down in Research Triangle understand this and they're helping me build it. So that is an example of how you use Wufu to design a business model. Yes, sir, back, back in the back over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Steve? Oh, yeah. Yeah, follow up over Yep. Isn't that the challenge, though, of open source? Isn't that the challenge of open source, which is don't try to develop your business model, your individual business model or your regional business model, on things that can be easily commoditized, right? So you have to look for the particular niches. And so what would be some of those niches? Let's think about that. Well, that's one of the pur whole purposes of what I was doing at REI at CASE. And let me outline some of the niches that we found. One is in creative digital media, specifically the integration of medical illustration and digital media. Medical education, 3D visualizations, simulations on surgeries, a whole range of opportunities that, are, that can emerge from the fact that we have an engineering school, a medical school, a law school, and, uh, 
and an art school all within 200 yards of each other about. So how many places on the planet have that combination? Not very many, not very many. There's another dimension of this, though, that you have to understand, I think. And that is, in order for us to move ahead, we have to understand that we're moving toward this kind of a model, which is, in the old line way of thinking, if in a resource-based economy, if you weren't number one, number two, number three in the market, you were not going to prevail. That was the old Jack Welch, General Electric view of the world. If I'm not one, two, or three in the market, we're out of the market. Why is that? Because the predominant business models in General Electric at that time were resource-based models. We've got to be the low-cost producer, otherwise somebody else is going to eat our lunch. We've got to get down that cost curve, that experience curve, as fast as possible. Now, as you move toward new business models that are based on networks, you start seeing a model, business model that operates like this, which is the more network connections you have, the higher the probability that you can create wealth and transfer and create something unique. The way to illustrate that in particular is the unique capabilities of everybody in this room, the brain power of everybody in this room is unique on the planet right now. We have a unique assembly of brain power and experience and connections in this room that's unique on the planet. That's true of any other collaboration. The question is, can we take that unique network of brain power and create wealth out of it? That's a fundamental question. And the challenge is to do that through networks. And that creates new opportunities. And that's why bioenterprises, for example, bioenterprise that, that moves and reaches out to Pittsburgh that's an exciting and new development that we ought to be applauding because that's a unique set of networks that's going to evolve out of that, and we're, we're likely to, to uh, benefit from it. Thank you.